morning. This is Faith at Faith and Books, and I'm doing my uh, next installment of May is Her Magazine on uh, McClure's Magazine. This is uh, volume 20, and it is um, November 1902, and I'm going to focus on, I think from now on through the end of May, I'm going to focus on Ida Tarbell's The History of the Standard Oil Company. So she was a very interesting journalist, and I'm interested in this for a number of reasons. Just the fact that she was a woman journalist so early, um, and that she did this sort of um, investigative reporting um, on, on a topic that might be typically sort of masculine. It's economics, and it's the oil and gas industry. Um, but she had interest in it because that's the area of Pennsylvania that she came from. So she had first-hand experience growing up because uh, her father, they were poor at first, and then her father um, had his own independent oil company once they discovered how um, viable oil was as a something to market. And uh, but then it got they got taken over by the uh, by I guess Rockefeller. Um, so, um, so I, I just find that really, really interesting. Also, that um, uh, just just the whole history of uh, using it as a source of energy. Just as somebody who cares about the environment, it's interesting to read the history of it because this was the beginning of relying on oil and gas, and you know, this was before cars or anything um, like that, and. Uh, we've just built all our technology, everything is built on the idea that we have these vast resources of oil and gas um, that we can work from and now we're desperately trying to find alternative uh, resources for, for energy. And so I just find that really interesting. Um, so, and this is an interesting time period for me too, just because I, I'm sort of fascinated by it in that sort of area of the world. My father was from Pittsburgh. I've never been to Pittsburgh. I want to go to Pittsburgh. Um, and um, if you've ever read the books by Mary, uh, is it Reinhardt Roberts or Roberts Reinhardt? I should know this. Um, anyway, hers, her, a lot of her books uh, were set in this time period and in this area. Or maybe it was set slightly later than 1902. But anyway, and this is the book that really put Ida Tarbell on the map. Well, I mean, she rose pretty quickly to, um, you know, get some status in the journalistic world. It only took a few years for her. And her first book was um, on Lincoln, and that was quite a success. And then this is the one, though, that really made her one of the greats. So it was published in installments in McClure's. She was working for McClure's. Um, so anyway, so I just think it's really interesting and I think I'm going to focus on it. Now, uh, I think I have six chapters in this volume. So each chapter was um, published in an issue. So I only have six chapters and I'm not sure of the whole book. I would like to get the entire book um, and see, you know, finish reading it because I don't think it's just six chapters. I think I'm going to, I haven't gotten that far, but... Um, I think I'm going to wind up just reading half the book um, through this magazine since this is all I have. Um, so anyway, it's a it's an interesting article. One thing that really surprised me was how early this all happened. It happened pre Civil War. In my head, oil and gas had to do with the automobile, and this is way before the automobile, um, and I couldn't understand. Where was the market? I, I couldn't quite grasp it. Um, so what happened was, um, in that area in the Allegheny Mountains in um, in uh, Pennsylvania, not that far from Pittsburgh, that whole area, um, there was this creek called Oil Creek. It was all already called Oil Creek, and there was already a town called Oil City. Um, so they knew that this oil was bubbling up out of the earth. And um, people had tried to market it, but just individuals trying to market as a, as an illuminating oil. That's what she's calling it. Um, but it, it wasn't going anywhere. And then somebody got the bright idea, I forget who his name was, and he sent it to his friend who was a, a chemist at Yale. 
and the chemist um, studied it and said, you know, this is actually a really, uh, this has great potential. He said, uh, his name was Professor Silliman, Silly Man. Um, and he said, let's see, the professor's report was published and received general attention from the rock oil, that's what they called it, rock oil, might be made as good and illuminant as any the world knew. So what were they using before? Was this whale oil that they were using? Um, it, was it, it's not, is this, is this what caused gas lights to come in? Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure. Um, in short, Professor Silliman declared, your company uh, have in their possession a raw material from which, by simple and not expensive process, they may manufacture very valuable products. It is worthy of note uh, that my experiments prove that nearly the whole of the raw product may be manufactured without waste, and this solely by a well-directed process which is in practice in one of the most simple of all uh, chemical processes. Now wait, where did he list all the different things that it could be? Okay, so not only did it make an, um, an illuminating oil, whatever that was, is that kerosene? I don't know. Um, it also yielded gas, paraffin, and lubricating oil. Um, so it was, I mean, you had to get it out of the ground, but you could just distill it. Um, and people knew about, um, you know, stills and how to distill things already. So that was already sort of there in place. Um, so then they had to face, once they realized that this could be manufactured, they had to get people... Uh, willing to go in and, and set up things. So they had to figure out how to drill it. They had to figure out um, how to contain it, you know, what kind of barrels or tanks to use. They had to figure out how to get it from point A to point B to the market. Um, so this is when sort of Teamsters became really important because they had to, this area of Pennsylvania was really rugged and it hadn't really been settled because it was so... Uh, rugged, so it was sparsely settled. The roads were not good, um, and so these uh, Teamsters really had a lot of power because they were hauling these incredible heavy barrels over these uh, terrible roads, and it caused all sorts of disruption. Um, and then they were trying to um, uh, move the the oil in the rivers, but the rivers were really they would flood and then they would get really low and they're just really treacherous so that was really hard and then they decided to they came up with the idea of pipelines and that became and all, people were fighting over property everything um it was a very rough and tumble um area and um you know kind of dangerous uh, so she goes into detail so here we go um I think this is the guy who designed the pipeline, the first pipelines. Um, she goes into detail about the uh, about the uh, the problems with transportation. Um, let's see what else. Oh, and how how they were refining it, developing the refineries, and then marketing how they would how they figured out how to sell it on the market, um, uh, the different technology needed for drilling. Um, let's see, we go an early refinery. There's a picture of an early refinery. Uh, and then she talks about just what it did to the people there. Of course, that this is her childhood. Um, that the people along like uh, Oil Creek and, and the Allegheny River um, rejected the uh, the saloons and like the prostitutes, she didn't say prostitute, but she said, you know, these fast women that were coming in. And so they made one town the site. That was the only place where that stuff was allowed. And all the other uh, little towns that were popping up weren't allowed to have anything like that uh, in them. And uh, the... Uh, 
it was kind of interesting because before churches came in were schools. They wanted their children to be educated, so each of these little communities would set up a school, and then that schoolhouse would be used for a union church, meaning it was just a sort of a non-denominational Christian church that people would would uh, worship him. Um, so, and then um, they got as they got more money. They got more sophisticated and they started having theaters and other things in the towns. And so it only took about 10 or 12 years to go from these really rough settlements that were basically people just living in tents and, and um, just this chaotic fighting as people were grappling for control over the area to developing sort of more civilized towns where they had worked, all, worked out all the problems with the drilling and the transportation and the marketing. And so they got sophisticated very quickly and it was the type of person attracted to the, uh, this sort of industry, which promised lots and lots of money. Uh, you got rich quick for sure. Um, um, that they, uh, that sort of person also sort of problem solved to make living there easier as well. So uh, the last, um, uh, let me read to you, oh, 11 minutes, okay. I don't want to go on very long at all. Um, but I just want to give you a sense of how she writes. So let me read just the first few sentences and then I'll read the very last short uh, paragraph. Um, chapter one, the birth of an industry. One of the busiest corners of the globe at the opening of the year 1872 was a strip of northwestern Pennsylvania and, over 50, and not over 50 miles long, known the world over as the oil regions. Twelve years before this, a, wait, twelve, I'm sorry, I'm not reading well. Twelve years before, this strip of land had been but little better than a wilderness. Its only inhabitants, the lumbermen, who every season cut great swaths of primeval pine and hemlock from its hills, and in the spring floated them down the Allegheny River to Pittsburgh. Okay, that's the first sentence. And then the last paragraph is, after she's gone into great detail about how they started this industry up and figured everything out, suddenly, at the very heyday of this confidence, because uh, they had developed a lot of confidence because they'd been so successful in problem solving and coming out ahead, a big hand reached out from nobody knew where to steal their conquest and throttle their future. The suddenness and the blackness of the assault on their business stirred to the bottom their manhood and their sense of fair play, and the whole region arose in revolt, which is scarcely paralleled in the commercial history of the United States. So that's Rockefeller and all those um, those big uh, monopolies coming in and taking over. So that's my McClure's for today. I'll do it again on Wednesday. Um, and I think that's it. I think I should let you go now. This is my people have been asking about what I'm drinking. Can you see that? I'm just drinking black coffee. And this is a mug. This is actually of my daughter and her husband. I'll just flash them on there. Um, I got this mug, I think from their, uh, his parents or something for their engagement or something. I can't remember now why I drink this mug. Anyway, so that's it from me, and I will talk to you tomorrow. Goodbye. See ya.